stars above that you send me all your love if my prayers would only be heard I'd show you how much I love you so, love is pure love is something no doctor can cure now the musical spotlight now shines with my feelings Without a doubt, Jamaica has given the world some great musicians, some singers, songwriters, and tonight's superstar is a word that describes my special guest on profile. He's B.B. Seaton, been in business for over 39 years. Does it feel like 39 years? No, it doesn't really feel like 39 years because I actually enjoy what I'm doing. You know, I'm. I would do the same thing over again for another 39 years if allowed. Well, you probably will be, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I really love what I'm doing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you look, one can't help to, to notice how you look so fit and fresh. What is your secret? I haven't got a secret, but I think um, if there was a secret, it would be, um, I think you reflect what's inside of you mm -hmm. on your screen, which is your face. And if you're a nice person inside or a genuine person, I think it, it comes out. You right. know? So I think God has been good to me. It, indeed. Yes. Now, one thing for sure, you certainly have brought a lot of fun and, and, and good things into people's life. Talking about your, your um, listeners, your people who listen to your recordings, yes. and also your fellow musicians. Because uh, BBC, you're responsible for some of the, the big hits of some of the artists from Jamaica. Um, Kane Booth, the name. But one. Yes, um, Ken Booth uh, was a very close friend of mine and mm -hmm. still is. And we actually worked together um, from Studio One days. Yeah. Um, when uh, we were, I was with the group, the Gay Lads, we were, w one at a time we were making hits. Um, and Ken Booth, you know, he tried everything and could make a hit. 
And he used to come to me and um, say, PP God, what's, what's going on? You know, and I'm saying to him, have patience, man, you know? Be very patient and yeah. it will work. And as a young guy myself, you know, saying this to another young guy, you know, even though I'm, and I'm thinking of what I was saying, yeah. you know, it surprises me. But um, we work together and I've written songs like um, Freedom Street, um, Say You, Girl I Left Behind, Just Another Girl, to name a few. To name a few, he yes, says. You know. Now, some of those hits, did you realize um, the, the, the impact some of those songs would have on the whole world outside of Jamaica? No, we didn't even actually know that the business would still be around in this time. Right. Because we were the pioneers. Indeed. And like pioneers, were the people who were supposed to feel the pain. Yes. You know, you have to make the sacrifice so other people can, you know, benefit of or live from the music, okay. you know. Now, before the Gay Lads actually became the Gay Lads, you, you teamed up with, with Delano Stewart, another, another um, big giant in the business. Well, Delano is, we, we go way back and we come way forward. Now Delano, oh God, how can I say it? He was with a group called the Rhythm Aces, mm -hmm. and they used to rehearse like um, around the block from me. And then I used to go and listen to them. I used to um, go to Cornell College, and then I, that was in Montego Bay. Yes. So I used to come up on holidays, and you know, during this period, I'd go and listen to them rehearsing. Yeah. And then um, I tried my hand at writing, and I took um, uh, one of my songs to Boris Gardner, you know, for him to check it out. Yeah. When he did, um, he said, God, it's good. So that encouraged me. Okay. And then I used to go around his house in the evenings um, for him to teach me harmony. And God, he used to give me some lick in my head. <laughs> so believe you me, you know, but every day I thank him for that, you know, because if it wasn't for Boris Gardner, you know, our group wouldn't be um, the great harmonizing group as right. people, you know, make it out to be. Indeed, and, and it certainly is because, I mean, when you talk about Jamaican history, the mu music, music history, I mean, people ha always have to mention BBC and the Gale as Delano Stewart. Yeah. Now, you, you said you were, you're from Montego Bay. No, no, I'm from Kingston. Okay, but, I, but for the college, you were in? I'd like to just tell you something about that. Come right? on, please. I, 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 I was very unruly as a kid. And my dad tried everything. I went to about six different schools, you know, um, vast preparatory, mm -hmm. this and all of that. But I was just mischievous. That's what I call it. And uh, they thought that um, sending me to Montego Bay, to Cornwall, would get me out of that oh, environment. Of course, yes, yeah? yes. Okay. But I, I went to school there, and um, <laughs> all I did, I was very good academically, because I came third in my class without even studying. But most of the time, I was actually singing you know, in the back with guys and, you know, yeah. giving jokes. So I thought that there, that was the, where it all stemmed from, mm -hmm. you know, and I came up um, after one holiday and I had a very good friend who used to attend KC by the name of Christopher Redwood. And um, this is Kingston College, not Kingston. Knox College. No, Kingston I went to College. Knox College. Yeah, okay. so. <laughs> we used to beat up you guys in, in football, man. But we won't <laughs> talk about that now. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know, um, we were so close, and um, uh, this is one of the reasons why I didn't go back to um, the school. I left school because of being with that friend, and music was on my mind all this time. Okay, you know. Now talking about uh, being a, a songwriter, uh, it, lyrics has to be written in a, a prose form, doesn't it, or does it? Well, how I, oh, what helped me to be with my songwriting was I was very good at poems as a right. exactly and composition okay and the three basic things that is they said was I'm um, like the beginning middle right. and the end and I always try to get my songs in that mode you know right. I always try to find something that people can sing along with and we call it the punchline you know like my Jamaican girl yes. you're waiting for that part to say my Jamaican you know yes that's sort of thing or any other hit song you, you may hear you know
We were listening to the Platters, the Drifters, um, mostly American artists, um, rhythm and blues um, and boogie, which is, was where the ska music uh, come from because okay. Cox used to go on farm working yeah. in, in America before he actually started the business. And then he came back with these records and they used to play them, you know, and on his sound. And um, gradually the musicians got together and, you know, right. some of the musicians that used to work on the North Coast, because that's the only place where they could um, earn a living. Of course, yes. Because there wasn't a record industry, you know, it was just in the making. So was that the, the, the uh, tourist uh, circuit that was? Yes, was yes. Then? So was it big then, the tourist circuit? Well, big enough to, to um, sustain the amount of musicians that were in the business. Okay. Um, because I spent a few years doing that as well, too, um, uh, working in Ultra Rise. What time was, was, this? was that? Before the gay lads or, or This was um, or during? Just after we did. Before you, he, you, um, you hear uh, Lady with the Red Dress. Okay. We were doing a lot of songs before, yeah? Like Brown Skin Girl and all these kind of thing with the scatterlights. B.B. Seaton was singing Brown Skin Girl. Yeah. Yes. With the gay lads. <laughs> right? <laughs> this is strange. And, um, but uh, they were on the hit on the sound of course, system. Yeah. Because in those days, um, our music wasn't played on the radio station. It, you, you know, we were exposed to American music. You yes. know that stigma. Yes, yes. And um, I got uh, frustrated uh, because, you know, tried so many songs and it wasn't going anywhere. And I took a break and went to um, Ultra Rest to work. Okay. I worked there for about three years doing Cabaret. So how did you, what did your parents feel about um, this, uh, this song of his, um, make, trying to make it his way in, in the music business? <laughs> The amount of beating I've got for that. Um, they couldn't, I mean, it was known as rag songs. You couldn't sing those type of songs in, in Jamaica. You know, it, it, it was non existent. There wasn't anything there that you could say, well, um, okay, when I leave school, I'm going to go back into music. There wasn't an industry. You know, we were the pioneers. Yeah. So we went through hell, both at home and even out abroad. <laughs> so did you realize at the time that money could be made from this? I mean, apart from the little um, living that you were making on the circuit, did, did you realize then? Well, before I went on the circuit, we used to make um, seven pounds ten. Well, that's a lot of money. In to every song that we did, right? Okay. That had to, to split three ways. Goodness me. Right? But we could have we could bought shoes, band and t-shirt, everything out of it. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, but yes. So um, as kids, because we were kids then, and we didn't have use for money in terms of, you know, having a plan or whatever. Okay. And we were kids, and our, we lived with our family, so we didn't, you know, our parents, so we didn't need that. Yes. So you moved on to, to Coxon. How did you actually get linked up with, with Coxon? Richard Ace from um, Rhythm is the yes. group I spoke about yes. earlier on. He was the one who took um, myself and Delano mm -hmm. there. When we went there, I actually sang, the first song I recorded was a song called Only You, Patricia Can Make My Dream Come True. Come true. And um, Ken Booth, ironically, was on the same session. Now, this is another um, something that you would want to know. When we, when we did the song, um, song, Ken's song was called um, Prevention. When he did it, did the studio tore down, all the musicians said, yeah, yeah, and everything. <laughs> no, me, poor little me, I did my song, and there wasn't any, if, if a rat squeak, you'd hear it. <laughs> and then about two weeks after, King Stitt, who was the DJ for Cox and yes, Sound, yes. said to me, BB, we're playing this song at least 10 times per night, you know, at Carnival and these places, and I say, you're joking. I couldn't believe it. So I said, come down one night, because we normally follow this set, you know, just to hear our songs yes, being yes. played. And I went there and I said, God, I, I was, you know, it really moved my heart so much, you know, because I didn't believe, you know, I thought Ken Wood was you know, singing, and that opened my eyes, you know, to realize that it's not a singer, it's a song. Mm. And this is where I started to channel my energy into okay. writing. Yes, yes. What is it about BB you think that, that makes him stay as long as he has stayed in the business? Well, his songwriting ability, you know. And BB can always come up with a new song. Uh, and, uh, you know, his writing ability, really, that's it. That's, that's the thing. I mean, we know over the years he's written maybe 60 or 70 hit songs. You know, he really is a wonderful songwriter. You actually into the, the, the set now with, with Coxon and involved with the studio 
and uh, you started to write your songs. And w w were they easy to, to get past Cox and your songs? Because I hear he's a, he's a, he was a strickler for um, good songs and make sure you can hold your harmonies. And, yeah. and actually, if, if it's not right, he'll say, come back next week. Did you get any of that? No, not really. He surprised me too because Coxon is not a guy who knows music. Right. And he surprised me, but he's got very good hearing. But when we left, when I left, I went to the North Coast and I got fed up of that because I wanted to write and be out front with the thing. And I came back and we teamed up with Delano Stewart and yes. brought Morris Roberts in. Of course, yes. And then I went to a place called Franklin Town in Kingston. Mm -hmm. And that night I was with one of my friends. So I went over this graveyard and I sat on this grave. And the song came to me, Lady with the Red Dress. <laughs> Strange. I'm telling you. Strange place to get inspiration. Well, I suppose it's me. probably a good place to get inspiration. When I'm scared of graves, I know all these things <laughs> are good. And I sat that. there and it came to me. And I wrote the song. And this is what we went back to Coxon with. And when we went back there, you had um, Bob Marley listening to us as well. Mm -hmm. Because like we were there before him. But Coxon's like that. Once you're in his team, you're either going to play an instrument. OK press some record, are you yeah. going to do something, yes. you know? And we came back and it passed with um, Lady with the Red Dress. Because, I mean, Studio One was a great learning place, wasn't it? So, I mean, often called you the university of music. Of music. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. indeed. Did you feel it there at that time? We were naive to a lot of things, you know, because we were creating history. Okay. Not even Cox himself knew what was going to happen. Right, right. You know, and I can laugh at it now, but there were days when sometimes we were hungry. Most of these songs that you hear on the records in those days, we were hungry singing those songs. And this is one of the reasons when I'm going to the studio now to voice a song, I always like to be hungry as well. <laughs> Brings it up. Well, I mean, yes. you're determined to get yes, something done, course. aren't you? But when your belly is full, you want to sleep. Apparently, you were drafted in there as, as a talent scout for, for, for Coxon. Um, when and, and how did that come about? Well, um, we were always um, a musical group, yeah? Yeah. So, uh, when we got paid um, and royalties, because we were one of the first groups in the history of Jamaica that got royalties. Well, that's and interesting. And we introduced that to yes. every. We are the ones who um, made it possible for other artists to be getting royalties. Yeah. And we'd use that money and we'd buy instruments from Cox himself. So the money's going back. Back to, yes, right? yes, yes. And uh, we'd rehearse, practice. Actually, it was Bob Marley who was with um, a guitar book with 7,000 chords. And he used to be playing his guitar. He was the one who inspired me to pick up a guitar and a chord book. And I did that, learned the guitar, teach, taught my um, friends to play the bass. And, but I don't know how I did it, but I did it. And we had this band, and we ended up back in the Whalers at a place called Perfect Place one night. Really? Yeah. Interesting. The history. That time, family man and those guys used to live on, on our corner and come and listen to us. Yeah, so they were even younger and than you, yeah. you guys. Yeah. And um, when we, we finished the show, Bob said, God, boy, you know, the first I've ever, um, ever felt this good uh, with a band. And I said to him, it's because we're artists as well, and we know what you would want, you know. So this is why the vibe was so strong. Yeah. And I think that was what influenced him to get a band together, because um, he took Family Man, who was taught bass by my bass player, Morris. He used to come and bars, um, bar his bass and everything. Interesting. This is the history. Even Sly, um, not Sly, Robbie, used to be on that same corner. In Montego Street, in yes. um, thing, all the artists used to come there with our band, Slim Smith, Melodians, you name them. They used to come there and rehearse with us. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's a free vibe. Anyway, I think 
Cox and Sp uh, Spot, the, the musical side of me, right? Because we were very close. And then he would say, go and check out some of the artists. Yeah. And I had the um, opportunity of giving people like um, the hip tones, melodians. Um, those are guys. You know, I actually turned down Pat Kelly in one of the um, auditions. Interesting. Can you remember what he sung? Sorry, Pat. <laughs> no, no, I can't remember what he, what he sung. But at the time, uh, Prince Buster was um, hitting the airway with yeah. it. Kind of, and you know that Prince Buster is not such a great <laughs> voice person. Right. So Cockney <coughs> said to me, when you out there in, um, audition the artist, I, I, I don't want to get any sweet voice. Okay. What I need is rough voice people. Okay. So I was just doing my job. Okay. I love Pat Kelly. And Pat voice. was a very, very falls at a high, yes. sweet. Yes. Not just him alone. Mm -hmm. Because even Lloyd Parks, um, I passed them termites. Yes. I gave him yes. the, the, the yes. go ahead too. Interesting. Um, and a couple of the guys who were singing with the sweet voice, I had to turn them down because I had us to do that. So actually, w when the, the Jamaican history book is written, you should be one that. that um, actually found these guys in a sense because if it well, if you had said no then we wouldn't have any melodians and uh, we wouldn't, wouldn't have, probably wouldn't have any hip tones <laughs> <laughs> you never know you know but i'm glad that i'm really a part of it I'm, i really feel humble about this right. you know and um and the great guy too who i brought to um Suda one was um jackie me too the great jackie the me great too. jackie me too Goodness he used to play with a band called the rivals that i used to sing with me and a guy called honey boy martin yes yes and um that day on the session, Cecil Lloyd didn't turn up. He was a great keyboard player. God bless his soul, he's dead now. Mm -hmm. And um, I took him down there, and you know there was no turning back. Goodness me. But Jackie, me too. Well, know. we thank you for that, certainly. You know, well, I thank God for the, the vibes, you know. Right. And of course, during that time, your, your, your songwriting was maturing, wasn't it? I mean, you was getting more mature in your songwriting, and your melodies were there. I go up, listen to BBC sitting in songs and believe in them, you know. It was a great pleasure when I came to England and I started doing music and find myself amongst ranks like him, meeting with him and becoming a friend of him is, you know. Um, it's great. One of my favorite songs will always be Born Free because whenever I feel tied up and, you know, feel, I don't feel down, but when I feel the world is like crumbling, I tend to go into Born Free, sing it, play, enjoy it and lift myself again, you know. So BB, they're the kind of people I always want to meet and work with. I remember one, one instant, um, this guy, you, there was a van in the back of Studio One mm -hmm. that every artist used to rehearse. Sometimes you had the Whalers, Jackie Opel, Ken Booth, Terry Wilson, you name them, um, Clarendonians. Yeah. And all of us used to be in this van under this mango tree. That's where we got our lunch sometimes. We used to be singing and we'd be singing everybody's song. But the beautiful thing about it is that regardless of you singing your song, you'd never find an artist going and do a song close to yours. We had that respect yeah, for each yeah. other's work and proud to do your own thing that is, you know, original. He's one of the founders for the music. He's one that one should respect in this business. And I'm proud to know that he have his launch tonight under my belt. I give thanks for him. Yeah, man. And what about what keeps you going sound? Well, people like BBC. Uh, <laughs> Chris Beckins, boy, it's great to see you. And yourself. Are some good things happening to you? Uh, yeah, yeah, get the production, the label's going good at the moment with my brother. And, you know, mashing up the streets. Really, and you're here supporting uh, one of the legends. Oh, of course, BB's like an inspiration to me. He, um, he's someone I see at least once a week who gives me immense, immense knowledge, everything, everything on production, on the business side of it, on the distribution, on the writing, on the auditioning, everything, yeah. You know, good girl. Norman G, we're talking to one of the UK's finest ever producers, Mikey Campbell. The original Mikey Campbell. <laughs> Let's get no confusion out of that. How are you doing, sir? I'm all right. I'm You're all right. Good. Yeah, I'm good. Right. Yeah, I'm you know, it's it's great to see people like you who are supporting, you know, your colleagues in the business. I mean, BB Seaton. Yeah, well, BB, you know, BB is from time. Well, BB is one of the best songwriters out of Jamaica. Mm -hmm. You say that without reservation. Without, without no reservation. Everybody know that. What is it about BB Seaton? You think that that gets him to to maintain and stay the course? 
as he has done. What does that say? He's a brilliant songwriter. He's a brilliant songwriter. He's been writing songs from the beginning till now. And you either have it or you don't have it. True, true. You know what I mean? First of all, I must say, this is one of the men that inspire me to love music so much. This man is one of the cornerstones of Jamaica music. Right? I remember when I was a youth, I used to follow Roland Alfonso go to Studio One. And I used to see this man at Studio One doing the audition. And I used to say to myself, I wish if I could be in that position. You know what I mean? Be a great singer like BBC. When he was singing with the gay lads, making all <laughs> now they are the great lads, making all those hits. ABC rock steady, lady with red dress. Hard to confess, all the big tune, right? My Jamaican girl, the blade to go down to Beverly's and me. This man has inspired me. No ends. Mr. BBC. So it's a pleasure to be here tonight. And it's a pleasure to be working with him as well. Because we made a, a single recently. Looking forward for, to do some more project with him. This one is one of the greatest songwriters ever come out of Jamaica, Mr. Bibi Sidney. Yes. From when I was a little schoolboy, come right up. <laughs> and I'd just like to say, it's great for to put this on for everybody tonight and everybody who's passing through and show respect for the man because he's still doing it, 2009. Big up, Bibi. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much. I would like to call um, Mr. Digby, Ras Digby. And he's from Amiga 104.1 FM. Good friend. Archie, I say good friend, Jay. Yes. Last eight, ten years that me and Digby form a real special friendship from what we the lost him. We nearly lost him. You know, and he's back, and he's come back with a zest that he just blow me away with his enthusiasm for the thing called music and the business. This man is in love with every note, and he's taught me so much in such a short time about the music industry. And I'm a proud man to know and have him, not only as a producer, but as a friend. And that lived life forever. BB, wish you all the best for all your contributions to the reggae music, to all of us here and all over the world. And we thank you and God bless you and keep you with good life and many more lyrics. There's, there's not many songwriters in this world that write as many songs for himself and other people and make hits. This man is a great man and we can hold him up as a true legend and the foundation of Studio One Treasure and his own label, Soul Beat. We give thanks. He seemed like there was a great camaraderie um, yeah. about the whole the whole Studio One thing. Um, what, what was it that, that 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 made this happen? Because sh surely, I mean, with, with so many people wanting that that hit or looking for the next hit, surely there there, there must be um, some kind of a bit of um, friction going on there. But it no, there wasn't a friction. Any friction as such. You may have the one and two um, thing that hasn't got anything to do with music. Mm -hmm. Because I think Coxon, one has to respect this guy, you know. Even though he may hear a lot of stories, and we aren't perfect, yes? Okay. But what he used to do, and I apply that principle sometimes in my um, thing, because you learn from, you know, the earlier days. He used to give all of these artists a day for themselves. And sometimes he would even be there. Most of the songs that recorded, Coxon didn't know about it until he came in in the evening, right. and then he would listen to the day's work and then choose from it. So you would put Ken Boot in this day, Gaelic mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Zin, and so forth. Right. And then, if you have the opportunity to record so many songs, you should be able to come up with a hit. You know what I'm saying? Yes, and yes. then he allowed you to do what you felt. So it was even, it's better for, it was better for everybody. So when he came in, he was, but the, 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 the competition now, okay. around the whole thing, it was a friendly competition. So was, there thing. was still com competitiveness yeah, going on. Yeah, but it was friendly. Yeah. It wasn't any yeah. um, thing, you know, like even, even when we were on stage, 
like after we made those hits and yeah. I remember one year when um, Willis made uh, Put It On and we made um, Lady With The Red Dress yes. and they had Simmer Down and we had uh, You Should Never Do That. Now there was a clash at Ward Theatre because you know they always keep this um, short Ward Theatre every of Christmas. Course, you yes, know, yes. Three, four shows and many different um, theatres. And that day we were worried because we said God put it on, it was really wicked and the message was put it on. This is how we, you know, he was saying yeah. I'm going to put it on and you then. Okay. The yes, yes, that yes. was the message. Mm -hmm. So we said, oh God, when we went into what theater that morning, we saw every woman, not every woman, I'm, I'm, you know, about 90%. Slight exaggeration. Yes. We, yeah. we allow you that. Okay. <laughs> they had red dress on. And when we saw that... That must have been a good feeling. Oh, when we saw that, we said, well, this is our morning. Okay, of course. And so said, so done. Right. Now, during that time, um, more, most artists were singing about, uh, we had the Rude Boy period, which was happening then. But you didn't get involved with that. Well, not too heavily, anyhow. Um, what was the reason for, for your um, non-involvement, as it were? I think that would stem from my upbringing. Okay. Because I was brought up in a middle class, sort of, in France. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that wouldn't stop anything if I'd gone the wrong way either. But I must tell you about this rude boy thing, when the Wheelers came with it. Mm -hmm. When the Wheelers came with this rude boy situation, it was creating havoc amongst the dance or people carrying knives and all of these things. And this is why I respect Coxon again. Because he had the Clarendonian singing Rudy gone to jail yes. to counteract that. And of course, Alton Ellis was, was doing the same exactly, thing as Exactly, well yeah. you know, okay. which was, which was yeah. negative and positive, you Absolutely. know, in yes. the music, yes. you know, and there's a history behind every record that is made, because it's a record. Yeah. See, but some of these stuff that they're doing now, um, I must tell you, it's not recording, really. No. Do, you feel, do you feel sad about that? I feel hurt, and, uh, and I can understand, because the youth, they have to, try and find something different. Okay. But what I find with, okay, if you take the American artists, for instance, the youth in America would tend to emulate the Americans yeah. the, from the 60s, I think, coming up. But the Jamaicans, they, they seem to disrespect the artist that is coming from the foundation. Okay. You know, when that was something that should guide them. Because yeah. we, we um, used to listen to the American artists. You know, and yeah. then we came up with our beat. So they should carry it on further, you know, in another you know, Would, would it be fair to say that um, a vast majority of um, the founder member and founding members of the, the Jamaican music industry has probably left Jamaica? Anyhow, a lot of them have left Jamaica. And, and, and because they're not really around the youths or the, 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 the singers of the moment, that's probably why a lot of that his, history has kind of been lost in a sense. I know that a lot of the rhythms are, are, are reused time and time again, especially the Studio One rhythms. But, but that's another aspect, um, but before, before we talk about the, the, isn't that the reason why um, the youths, or the uh, nowadays singers, uh, tend to go astray, if that's the way you put it? Well, if, what amazes me is that they're using the rhythm, but they won't give us the respect, <laughs> you know? And they're saying to hey, this is the new yeah, thing. It's yeah. nothing new. Mm -hmm. It has been there before, and you need to put back something where that's coming from. That's what I'm saying. Okay. You know, you have the guys who come out on a big international hit and they are saying, what were you doing with your time? Yeah. What we were doing with our time was making it possible for you. Absolutely. And, and talking about respect, I mean, you, uh, after the, 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 the group had disbanded with Delano going solo and you yourself getting yeah. there, you, you took time out to, to um, actually look after your fellow artists. I mean, you got involved with the Jamaican Musician Federation, or the Jamaican Federation. Jamaican I, could, Federation I could never Federation. get that right. I know, I know. Okay. I know. But you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, a union for, for musicians, songwriters, singers. Yeah. And that was one of the first um, body that was formed, actually, to look after musicians. And you, you, you um, took that up, you know, which was a brave step in, in those days, because with producers fighting against artists, in a sense, not, not giving them their dues, and you actually took the plight of the, the uh, musicians, songwriters on your shoulders. Why? Well, the union 
was around for quite a while. Yeah. Because like Baron Lee and these guys used to be present years ago. But it was pretty inactive. There wasn't much. It happening. was it was active, but it was active on the North Coast area. Okay. Because there was no reason for it to be active in this Tudor era. Because it wasn't an industry as such right. as yet. Okay. Now when it became an industry, we saw the need to um the plan was, that was why I went into the union, to actually deal with the recording industry side of it. Yeah. Because I saw that was neglected. Absolutely. Now the idea was to set it up that when, when a kid leaves school, he could say, well, I'm going into the music business. Yes. And know that it is set up properly, that he would be protected and he would be trained properly. Because what I find is that most of the guys that are making hits here, when they go abroad, to do a show on TV or whatever. Then most of them, they're not prepared. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And you need yeah. that thing to prepare them. But, um, and also we were trying to, when the, the, the musicians were recording the rhythms and the uh, producers used to use them time and time again, mm -hmm. we were trying to um, implement uh, a program that they would pay even half of the money right. to the musicians. Yes, of course, they're the originators, yeah. yeah. Yes. So we actually, we got all of the musicians, the top musicians in the country to, um, because you needed the best. And if you could, you know, and we, it was working because we, we struck off a lot of studios, including Dynamics at one time, you know, and then you still had mu um, musicians sneaking in late in the night yes, to go yeah, work. So we yes. had to police that as well. Okay. And we also, we, we called a strike on JBC for not playing, you know, reggae music yeah. in yeah. Jamaica. We did all of that, you know. But you see, education is a hell of a thing. Because I had several um, educational programs at the um, uh, Wyndham, before it was the Wyndham Hotel. Right. And how I had to get the artists to come there, to look about their selves. Okay. I had to say that we're going to serve food. <laughs> and then we didn't serve the food until after we told them what, the what it was about. about. I mean, yeah. it's sad, but I can understand. Mm. Special guest, um, B.B. Seaton, tracing the history of Jamaican music. He was there, he knows. Stay tuned, we'll be back after this short break. One of these mornings, you're gonna rise up singing. In the early 70s, B.B. Seaton cut his reggae version of Summertime in Kingston, Jamaica. Melody so relaxed that you could go to sleep singing it and putting it on a reggae rhythm. I think that gave it life, you know. And you know, because when I was singing it, I remember the beat, you know, it was so pulsating that I was actually floating on top of the rhythm with that melody. Welcome back to Profile, special guest, BB Seaton, singer, songwriter. Historian, musically speaking. Now, we were talking about uh, the, the union, the Musicians' Union, yes. um, the Federation of Jamaican Musicians. Now, you actually um, left that. Um, what was the reason for leaving? Uh? Um, I'd been the vice president for about three years, mm -hmm. and um, the musicians wanted me to be the president. Mm -hmm. Sonny Bradshaw was the um, president at the time, okay. and I told him I, I wasn't interested in being the president at this time okay. because of the knowledge. I didn't really have the knowledge to handle something like that. Okay. You know. Would you say yeah. it was a success, the Federation? It, um, you need something there mm -hmm. to, to police the thing, but whether it's working to its fullest is another thing. Okay. I don't think it's working to its fullest because a union is only as strong as its members. Absolutely. Because absolutely. unity is strength. Yeah, absolutely. You see, and um, uh, as I said, it goes back to education, you know. Mm. Because I know and uh, now in, in Jamaica we have the PRS, uh, a branch of the PRS down there yes. uh, who is probably carrying on the same thing, in, in a sense, the same work as yes. what you started. You know, so here we are, wh which is, uh, was pioneering work f for you. Um, Good thing you, you actually started that, in a sense. Yes. Um, and uh, Or encouraged it, I should say. Yes, and I was hoping that um, they would carry on, you know. But I, I, I had to leave that to deal with my family, you know, my kids and everything, because um, it was a non-paid job, you know. So, um, was it really? Yes, I was doing it 
making a sacrifice because yeah. I, I saw the need, yeah. you know, um, and it's a pity a lot of people didn't see the need. Well, um, hence, hence, you know. hence um, as I said into, in, in my intro about you being the musician's musician, yeah. you know, yeah. um, caring about your fellow mm -hmm. artists. Mm -hmm. You know, and but um, so early seventies into the seventies, your career took off again because you, you, the solo project started going quite well. Um, yes, I did. Um, uh, the first song I did um, solo after I left the, the Killers was um, "Accept My Apology." Yes, and that was um, a monster hit in Jamaica. Did pretty well for you, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, it did. <laughs> I, I was pleased, you know, um, being on your own. Yes, and. Um, leaving the name with the guys and trying to create a new name. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. a very hard thing, mm -hmm. you know. But um, because people knew me um, with the gay lads, yes. so I think they accepted me right. quite readily. Of course. And um, I did Lean On Me, um, Thin Line Between Love and Hate. A monster which is now yes, uh, been yes. revived once again. I'm telling uh, you, that, that song has been revived so many times. You see, and, and in fact, you were, you were one of the, the first ones who actually um, did a version to version that particular song. Yes, because the original version was done by the Persuaders. Indeed. And indeed. Um, this, my version was uh, produced by Lloyd Chalmers. Yes. Love is this love is this love 
you have a knack of picking the right songs, it seems. Well, I didn't choose um, Thin Line Between the One yet. No, I didn't choose it for me because okay. um, we oh. used to work together. We formed that thing called, a company called Splash right. in, in those days. And we, had, uh, we were working with Ken Booth, um, Buster Brown, as the Messenger. Right, Chairman, I'm say, as the messenger. Another one of the uh, groups yeah. which uh, certainly um, brightened up Jamaica for a while. Then. Yes, yeah, yeah. We, did, we did quite well. And um, with four great guys like. Three great guys, you know, with myself. You know, it's, what it's what was the idea behind that? Because here you are, you, you had your, your solo career going well, and then you were working with, with Lloyd, and Ken Booth, Busty Brown, and yourself. Well, we were actually trying to do what Coxon did. Okay. Because um, you notice that there's a group called the Freedom Singers in, in Studio One. Yes. Well, anybody and anybody who sang at Studio One had to be the freedom singers. Freedom singers. <laughs> yeah? Okay. So because we were working with Splash, anybody who was with that we had to be the messenger. Okay. But actually before that, this is an interesting thing uh, you might want to know. You must have heard of Lynx. Yes, yes. Now the Lynx was the first organization of artists coming together mm -hmm. to do their own recording. Yes. And that consisted of uh, Ken Booth, Delroy Wilson, yes. the Melodians, yes. and Gaylord. The first song we recorded was It Comes and Goes. Yes. And Give Love a Try with Deroy Wilson and his songs, and it went straight into the yes. chart. Yes. We didn't have uh, uh, complete knowledge on the music business because this was something we were trying yeah. because we were fed up of being told that the song weren't selling and all Indeed. of these things. So we wanted to know for ourselves. Yes. Well, in fact, I was going to talk about uh, the, the fact that um, artists um, forming their own label was was uh, something that was really frowned upon, especially from producers. Of course. Yeah, because uh, um, I suppose I can say this, they used to go to radio stations and, and encourage the DJs not to play. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> I was just about to tell you that. So tell me about that. How did that, that make you feel? I mean, there you are, you're, you're writing your songs and you're trying to make a living for yourself and you're getting this added fight. You didn't know because you're so naive. Okay. You didn't know that. We were just trying something, okay. yes? Yeah. How I found out was about 10, 15 years after, Neville Lee from Sonic Sound said, God, we used to give you guys a fight. Really? In a joking manner, you know? And I said, in my mind, God, he didn't realize it was me he was fighting, if it was my kids. Yeah. And I really felt yeah. sad about that, you know? Because um, if we were making good, mu good music, you should allow us to come through, man. And you were making some good we music. We were making nice. good music. Because even the, the, the Whalers had their own um, record label started. Okay. They had people like uh, yes. Errol Dunkley and yes. even Gregory. Well, it was Gregory and Errol at the time. Yes. And then you guys, you know, and, and also you tried that. And were you successful in, uh, in, in any way at all? Well, we were successful in making a record, a hit record. Okay. What broke up the links was lack of knowledge right. um, both in the business side of it mm -hmm. and also the understanding between the artists yeah. because when the Melodian song um, hit the, 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 the number I think it was number two hours in Jamaica they said that both it, charts from what both I, charts I, I, of course recall, yes. they said it was their song that was the hit so they should get the money and you, you see the ignorance yeah. and the yes, whole thing yeah, so yeah. that kind of messed up the, 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 the thing and I'm saying to myself, God, here I am, a young guy like everybody else yeah. and I'm trying this thing. I don't even know where I'm going. So the more help I can get or the more we are together, is the happier we should be. But Supposedly. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> but it, it, it just didn't work that way and I had to move on. You okay. know, and, um, and you didn't move on, you did. I did. You, when did you actually write Freedom Street uh, for Kane Booth? Freedom Street was written in uh, 1950. God, I want to be sure, 73, 74, okay. around yes. that yeah. period of time. Because um, that was when he released the album, I think it was called Freedom Street. Freedom Street, yeah. yes. Which had several tracks written by yourself on that. Yeah, it had yeah. songs like Mr. Wind, Drums yes. of Freedom, um, Now I Know. Some classic, classic, classic songs. songs. Yeah. Definitely. And, and in a sense, they, they really stood the test of time, didn't they? Well, believe you me, yeah. I've got my own publishing company now. Right. Called Metronome Music. And, uh, I can see where you know everything is. So when did this move from Jamaica to England? When did that happen? That happened. And why did it happen? Well, it happened when I got frustrated. If I can't be personal. No, I, I, I'm willing to tell you. Okay. I like to pour my heart out yeah. to you because I'm, I'm relaxed with you now, man. 
um, uh, it was in 1985 when I was with the union and I left it after um, they had this, uh, they wanted me to be the president, so they had the election. Okay. And um, uh, Sonny Bradshaw used a clause on me. I didn't pay my dues until about a week before the, the um, election. Okay. So he said that there's a clause in the, um, uh, that booklet, memorandum, I mean, the, the, the memorandum yeah. that you have to pay it a period of time. So, you know, they got me out there. And I said, God, maybe it's a blessing in disguise because my kids need to, to be taken care yes. of. And um, luck was on my side. Some guys from um, Ochoas came and they um, wanted to get into business. And they had a group called Tanglewood that they wanted me to produce. Okay. And I was <coughs> doing my album at the same time. And I was running short of cash. Okay. So I said to them, I'll produce your album. You pay me. And then you can help me to finance my album as well. And they did that. So we all came to England um, in 1985. And then I, that's when I released um, Everyday People. Yes, another big hit. Yes. The return of BBC. <laughs> I keep saying the return, but you never returned. You were always there. <laughs> they think like I'm John there. <laughs> <laughs> the return of John. Yeah, so that, you, I understand you, you mm. know. And uh, that was another point of my career again. I was with um, Creole. Yeah. And um, put out this album called um, Everyday People as yes, well. Yes, yes. You know. It didn't. It wasn't a monster hit or anything like that. But I could um, live from it. You know? right. Now, with, with all the changes that that has happened um, with Jamaican music, um, as I said before, the ska, the reggae, the rock steady, the dancehall, the DJ, because throughout that you were there, yeah, uh, as well. You know, and and here you were in 1985. You know, still riding this success. You know, and and in my picking the song again, another song, yes. everyday people. Yeah. You know, and a, a monster hit. How did you feel about your career at that stage? I was in two minds. I was um, a bit agitated. I was um, frustrated to a point where because I had to leave Jamaica. Mm. You know, to come to England to 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 do my music. Yeah. When I sacrificed so much in Jamaica, you know, it, it wasn't. So I kept going back, kept okay. going back, you yeah. know, like, because I've never been... Don't want to leave. Yes. No, yes. you know, I've never stayed in this country, um, even though I'm living here now, longer than a, um, a year. You know, I always like to go home and recharge. Um, but I've set up my publishing company here, and I'm working with um, uh, Sprint Record, which is a new and upcoming um, company yes. run by um, Sammy Fetter. Is it easy... Um, running your, your business now? I mean, of course, you, you, you know more about the business now than you did then. Yes. Um, is it easy actually running that company? It's easy in the sense of knowing where you want to go and knowing what you're doing. But people that you have to deal with on a daily basis, mm -hmm. sometimes they can make it difficult for you. Because um, there's a song now that seems to be going somewhere, Red Rose, that I had written right. um, years ago. Uh, there was... Um, this um, instrumental called Telstar. Telstar. So I wrote the lyrics to Telstar. Mm -hmm. And um, they, um, there's a song coming out now with Sharon Foster. Sharon Foster. Into the reggae version yes, of it. Yes. They've used my lyrics, they've used my um, arrangement. Um, but it's like the company, the publishing company, the guy who wrote the Telstar is dead. And this is a trust. Okay. And they um, actually don't want me to use anybody to do anything different with the songs because yes, yes. you know you can demand that yes yeah but um i have my solicitor working on it now. but these yeah. are the things you have to deal with um, on a daily basis you know yes and uh, as we're talking about uh, um, lawyers and, and and royalties not getting royalties ub40 um, um covered one of your songs yes yes that was a blessing in disguise yes <laughs> how how did you feel about that because here you are you know, a song which some people say, okay, it's one of those songs that was in the catalogue somewhere. 1969. And 1969, and, and UB40 found this song. Because mm. um, I, I actually remember, remember writing a, something about that. Yeah. I think because it was Ken Booth was involved, and yeah. I think Hoddy Boy was also involved. Because they, yes, they covered uh, several songs from that era, right. including yours. Yes. Um, you're talking about getting frustrated when it comes to collecting what's yours. You know, how do you think that could be corrected? Um, well, when it comes to the publishing now, mm -hmm. I think I'm, I'm, I'm on top of it. You are? Because I've got about 70% of my songs under my publishing. Right. I've got songs published with Polygram, EMI, yeah. Creole. Those are songs that I've given, I've given to them in the 
earlier days right, which yeah. um, the contract says it's in perpetuity, mm -hmm. meaning for life. Yes, but okay. all I'm doing is trying to keep in touch with those companies of that they keep paying for my work because yeah. I don't mind who have it as long as I get paid. Right. Is it yeah. easy keeping up with um, who's got what of yours? It's very easy with the companies like EMI and these companies because mm -hmm. they're not going anywhere. Right. But what's the, what's the frustrating um, bit? The frustrating bit is when, what I hate is when somebody cover my song and I don't do a good version of it. That's annoying. That's really annoying. And um, like the smaller type of people, they cover your songs. You know you're not going to get paid. Okay. You know, because I don't really follow up those things unless it's on the, the big nice chart. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, for those people who are watching who don't really understand the, the publishing, and as your man in the know, yeah. and I'm sure there are our viewers who are writing songs and, and probably want to know what to do. Um, so that they don't, they don't fall in, in certain traps that uh, a lot of um, your fellow artists have fallen into. How would you advise them all? Well, first, um, how you publish your song, or you copyright your song, actually. Because when you publish a song, when you make a record, you have already published a song. Because the idea of publishing is to cause it to be heard. Okay. But copyright is the right to copy. Yes? Mm -hmm. So what you do is when you write a song, the normal thing, the easiest thing to do is just put it in an envelope, register it to yourself, okay. and don't open it. You understand? Okay. That's, that's proof that it was written in that period of time. Right. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Other than that, you can go to a, a publisher, or you can try and get your songs published yourself. By starting a publishing company, it's not very hard. Okay. Had you known this um, 30 years ago, do you think you would have been better? Um, at, at running a business now? I don't know because I, maybe I would have How gone... How would you have gone to the same thing? Maybe I've gone into <laughs> the business side of it and didn't write so many songs. All right. You yes. know, because I'm saying to Alton and these guys, God, I wish I would sing a lot of songs like you guys. But like I was too aware of what was going on in terms of the artist royalties and yeah. that, so I was yeah. kind of reluctant to sing for a lot of people. Yes. But sometimes ignorance can be in your favor, you know, Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. in the cases like that, you know. Right. Now, we can't help notice um, you've been called upon several times to do the honors at certain shows. You know, um, what, what, what's been billed as revival shows, our yes. oldies yeah. or whatever. I mean, Sunsplash and... Mm -hmm. You've been pretty much in demand for the last couple of years. God, and it's really refreshing, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it, it makes you feel like um, you're alive again. Yeah. And I, I don't mind singing these songs... Um, you know, because the joy that it brings to people, when you see their faces, when they yes. hear these songs, it makes you, I don't know, it makes me feel so good. Like money and these things are irrelevant to the joy that I feel when I'm doing a song like people say, God, this has, if you know what this has done for my life, yeah. you know, it was worthwhile writing a song like that. Yeah.
Here you are in 96, you know, um, are songs coming to you easy, you know, uh, uh, songwriting? No, not really. I, I had a mental block about um, two years ago and I couldn't write a thing. Whatever I wrote, I just tore it up because it didn't feel. I even did some recordings that I'm, I'm sorry I did, you know. Um, who knows, maybe there might be a hit somewhere else, but okay. I didn't feel pleased with it. Right. But I've just finished an album now because the, I've gotten back that writing vibes now. Yes, yes. And um, I've got this new record out now, just about a couple of, about a week and a half, and um, it's called Reggae Land. I'm thinking of calling the album that, but every track on that album could be a name for an album. Okay. That's the sort of writing I'm in, back right, into, right. right? I think I've found it again. So you've got the formula back, huh? Yes, I have yeah. indeed. Well, that's good. You know, I mean, here we are, as I said, in 96, and it's great to, to know that um, someone such as you still manage to, to, to write all, all what's happening now, all the different styles, the genre of music that we've been through, yes. you know, and you still manage to find that, that, that hit. You know, um, how do you feel about reggae music now, or reggae now? Reggae music is a beat pulsating beat and if you put the right ingredients together this is the thing is what the, the youth need now right some positive <coughs> lyrics because you have good reggae making you know you've got a lot of good reggae records being made but they're not being exposed because somehow it seems like the DJs seem to catch on to the under me this and the girl this and that more than the positive vibes yeah. no um this song that I've this album is something you now to give them guidance. This is saying this is a reggae, this is reggae land. Okay. Yeah, and there's no no monkey music now control. Yeah. <laughs> this is what it's saying. Okay. So you're gonna get a message when you play that record. Would it be fair in saying that um, maybe the reason why you're not too keen on what's happening now is because there is this generation gap, or is there a generation gap? You know, I mean, things have moved up because one argument could be that um, what's happening now is is what the youths want and what they're reflecting in what's around them. Just like, say, how, how in the, the 60s you were going off of what was happening around you. Would it be fair to say that? Yeah, it would be fair in a sense. It would be fair, you know, because um, what they're doing is what they know best. Okay, right. Maybe they're trying to emulate us, but that's where they came up with. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember when Radix band came about, Radix band was one of the most underrated band because the, the proper musicians were saying, no, oh, these guys can only play two calls. Two calls, yes. Yes? Of course. But they learned something. They learned that James Brown was only playing one. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then he ran some nines down and said, take me to the bridge. Ah! Yeah. And that was it. Tap, 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 tap. But it was tap, 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 just one chord. And funnily enough, that was Bob Marley's idol. Interesting. See what I'm saying? Yes, yes. So he picked a winner. Indeed. So who you know, so I'm not yeah. against um, the youth trying to think. All I'm okay. saying to them, look, we want this thing to be around in the year 2000 or 3000. Right, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So you, to keep it there, like how we did it in the 60s and it's coming back again in the 90s. Yes, yes. There was the ingredient in it, that input, that was more than money. Yeah. It was the love of the thing, yeah. the enthusiasm as, yeah. as youth. So this was one of the reasons to why I don't like him to... to do back any of my songs mm -hmm. because I don't think I could capture about that enthusiasm. Because right. at the that, time, yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. I'd like one of those kids to do it. Yeah. Now, you finally, your production work. Yeah. Your production work, um, you're getting more and more into, into producing, and more so than, than, than you were a couple of years ago. You've got your own studio, yeah, and uh, you're setting up things properly. If I could say that yes. properly, yeah. and you're recording people like AJ Franklin. Yes. Yeah. What What is it like um, working from that angle? 
it's something that I've been always doing. So, you know, I'm just going through the motions. I love, still love the music. Right. And even when I'm 91, if I live that long, I still be doing what I, I do best. Right music and um, I like working with um, AJ Franklin because he's coming from the old school, of course. chosen few yes. and um, we're great friends. Right. And the thing is you haven't lost this, this knack of um, finding your harmonies and stuff like that. Which I, can you ride a I bicycle? Can, if, you, if you learn <laughs> to ride a bicycle, would you forget? No, you know, well, you know, I, I, I will still um, do that. You know, and I, I, what I'd like to do is really impart some of my knowledge yeah. onto the kids. That's what I like to do. You know, and I don't know if it's going to be in England. It might be in Jamaica. You know, I'd love it to be England as well. Okay. You know, but um, I guess it might be Jamaica. And, and the final question, can reggae music be made in England? No. Reg reggae music can be made anywhere. Okay. Right? Because you know the old saying, well, boy, I don't think reggae music can be made in England. That was before they had drum machines. Okay. But do, <laughs> when you program that drum and tell it, play it plays. you know but what was the problem was the feel the drummer okay. and you you know the feel overall yes. you know it was difficult to capture that feel. okay but no because they have the um drum machines and all these electronic things it's um easy it's a good thing well it, it can only be good if we get some benefit from it in jamaica as the people who created the thing all right well bb seaton it's been a pleasure talking to you and i'm sure when, when jamaican music history is written you would Definitely will be at the top. Well, I hope everybody reads my book when it's finished. Because I'm book? writing a book. Okay, and the title of the book? It's um, Through Authentic Eyes. Reggae music through authentic eyes. And a film to follow? Well, uh, hopefully somebody <laughs> will take it on. <laughs> yeah. Maybe see, it's been great. Yeah, man. Nice right. to see you again now, man. Thank you. Thank you. Profile, that's it. Uh, this is a story, you know. Uh, Right, you know, born in the end of the gay lads, you know? Yes. Uh, real thing. Well, this man, eh, I me a real sugar one. Eh. I used to do everything I got to. Him bring Delroy Wilson, all them man, they come on to me when Cox. You see that? Right? <laughs> BB must tell the man them thing, you know. When me talk, the, 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 the most people... They tell him you're from the ass's mouth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right? You, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slim Smith was dead, right? BB, everybody, BB was Bob Marley, everybody. You should listen to this one. It's real, reality, it's man, you know. I throw your talk, you know. No, I don't like me a thing. Uh, other thing, you know. And, and most of the people are from. BB was like Sudawa. Yeah, man. Yeah. BB do everything up this song. Cox only go look out the business and <laughs> come in at night time and drink, drink some rum. C'était l'événement au festival de Bagnoles sur 16 en août 2012. Un groupe venu des origines du reggae remonte sur scène pour la première fois depuis 40 ans. Face à 10 000 spectateurs, les gay lads chantent un morceau écrit en 64, Africa, l'un des premiers hits jamaïcains qui parle explicitement du retour en Afrique. I can't control the spell that's come over me. I see rivers that flows down to the sea. Mountains so high, trees that reach the sky. It's pleasing to see.
no chains on my feet, uh, but I know the fight is not over, not over, cause I just can't seem to break free. Got on me. No ships on the water coming to take, take me away. No cutting cane in the sunshine or even in the falling rain. That I'm free, I'm free. That doesn't mean I'm really. So I got to work twice as hard, run twice as fast, jump so very long just to keep on. Run twice as fast. 